if you're looking for direction or need to spend time with the Lord, yeah, please reach out. Talk to Doug after service. That's next Saturday. Youth group, uh, junior high at Rideau Christian on Tuesday, and then regular um, senior high here at uh, 6, 6, 6 for junior high, 615 for senior high. The Wednesday prayer home group would be at our house if you're interested in coming. Well, we have dinner and then we spend time together. And if you'd like to, anyone can come at any point, even if you haven't been coming, uh, we'd love for you. So if you need directions, you can talk to myself or Amy about that. There are other opportunities. We encourage you to be reading the announcements. If you don't get the announcements digitally, just... Uh, Send your email to me, and I will put you on the list. And you don't even actually have to go to me. You can go to our website at northgateministry.com, and there's a little tag that says if you want them, and you just put your email in, and it's quite easy. We don't even have to do it. You can do it, but we're happy to do that as well. Let's pray, and we'll get into God's Word. Thank you, Jesus. We pray that you would bless your Word this morning. We need to hear from you. We need to be encouraged. We need to be challenged. You know each one in this room, Lord. And we pray that they would meet with you in this time. Or for the kids downstairs as well, that you'd bless them. Lord, that your hand would be working. Pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So if you do have a Bible or a phone or however you uh, like to look, there are Bibles on the back uh, red tables as well, but we're in the book of 2 Corinthians. Last week we were in chapter 3. We know Paul is the author just for a little bit of a recap. It's a little bit of a challenge with these Corinthians because they have... uh, chosen some of them to follow a different path than what he's encouraged them in. He founded this church years before, so he's writing this letter. He's being attacked. His, his message is being attacked. It's difficult. We learned in chapter 3 that the majority of his message and push is the new covenant, Jesus, and what Jesus has done for us in the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive us and set us free yeah and as we learned there are those who have come in who believe but say that you must do something as well it's not just belief but you would have to be circumcised or follow some part of the law and Paul clearly states that that won't work we need the ministry of the spirit that unfading glory because in our own effort to obey It might last for a while, but the fade wears off. We want to work from the inside out. Amen? Everyone remember? Everybody okay? Yeah? Yeah, good, good. Okay, so Paul challenged, gave the message again in chapter 3. And here we come to chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, and I will read it to you this morning. Therefore, because everything he said in chapter 3. Since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, 
that was shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for jesus sake that the life of jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh so then death is working in us but life in you and since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written i believed and therefore i spoke we also believe and therefore speak knowing that he who raised up the lord jesus will also raise us up with jesus and will present us with you For all things are for your sakes. The grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction is yet for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, sometimes when I'm in church and someone reads a whole passage, I get lost and my mind starts drifting somewhere else. Did that happen to anyone today? I won't ask you. But I'd like, okay, you lost me after verse 2, okay? But it is important that we read God's Word. Amen? And there are parts. Now, chapters 4 and 5 are some of my favorite chapters. And you actually could take little verses and do sermons on them because there is so much encouraging. But what we want to do is take the whole context and filter out of that some application for our lives. I want you to note two times in this chapter, he gives them an encouragement. And it is simply this in verse 1 and verse 16, that we would not lose... Anyone want to finish it? Heart. I think the New Living Translation says it like this, that we would not give up. Now, let's understand Paul, a little recap, what he's going through, people not really listening to him, people attacking him. If we we will in a minute, but we'll look, he's persecuted, he's forsaken, he's, yeah, going through a difficult time. Actually, in chapter 1, it said he despaired unto life. Like, this group of people is really challenging him, let alone all the other things Paul is going through. Uh... In chapter, I believe it's 11 or 12, he's going to talk about how he's been yeah, persecuted, whipped, uh, fasted, shipwrecked, uh, um, all of these physical sufferings. And then he says, on top of that, I think of all the churches each day. He has this tremendous burden for those people that he's led to the Lord. And he's got so much going on, and he could easily think about Everything that's not going well. But yet, it's almost he's telling himself, as he tells them, as he tells us, do not lose heart. Maybe in your life, let's make it a little applicational this morning. Do you have people in your life who are not responding to what God wants to tell them? Do you have people in your life who aren't believers, but it seems no matter what you do, they won't listen? Do you have people who are just living in sin and won't turn? And it is so, so discouraging, especially because you love them very much. Are you being persecuted by angry people? 
Are you being persecuted or suffering in any way physically? There's tremendous challenges in life, and especially as we desire to do what God asks us to do, it is easy to lose heart. And Paul knew that, and that's why he's saying this to us. Now, this passage in chapter 4 is one that I've often heard taught on at a pastor's conference. Because as a pastor, Paul's saying, don't lose heart when people don't come to the Lord, when people don't do what is right. Don't lose heart. But as we're preparing this week and, and thinking about this, it's not just for pastors, it's for every one of us, because all of us are trying to do what God wants us to do, right? Hello, right? We're all ministers of the gospel, amen? Or is it just the singers and the speaker and the usher? We're all trying to do it, right? Okay. Have you ever been discouraged? Have you ever been like, it doesn't matter what I say, nothing's working? Does it, have you ever thought they're a Christian and they're acting like this? Have you ever heard of marriages that are falling apart? Have you ever heard of... People just not doing what they're supposed to do and been really discouraged? Well, don't lose heart. That's what he's saying. Don't give up. And as we look at this passage, there's just a few things, just three things, and you could come up with your own three points, but I want you to leave this place encouraged not to lose heart. I just want to tell you on a side note, Jesus knew that it would be easy at times to lose heart. Do you remember when he told that parable about prayer? And he said, basically, I'm telling you this parable in the Gospel of Luke that you will not lose heart in prayer. Why would he have to tell them a, a parable about not losing heart in prayer if he didn't know that they had the potential of losing heart in prayer? And I just thought about this, and even in these words here, God knows we're flesh, and it's difficult and challenging, so he gives us his word in his grace to say, keep going. I love that about God. He's not up there like, I can't believe that you would ever think of giving up, right? I can't believe that you'd ever lose heart. Like, no, I know it's going to be a challenge, so here are some words to encourage you. Isn't God wonderful? So, firstly, I don't know if I could phrase it like this, but sometimes in my life, it seems no matter what I do, the enemy is greater, but the truth is that God is greater than our enemy, right? And as we look at this, and you go through, and he talks about not losing heart, he says very clearly that we walked well, we, we handled God's word well, um, but it seems the gospel or the good news is veiled to those who are perishing. But then he adds in verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe. Have you ever tried to share your faith with someone or what you believe and you left and you're like, oh, I said that all wrong. Have you ever said that? Or you're like, I should have said this. Or I should have done this. Or you have a Christian friend and, and you're trying to help them and you're like, oh, and you leave the conversation and you're like, that just came out all wrong. Am I the only one? Right? And it's so difficult then at times. But we don't understand because we're looking at ourselves. But the reality is in, in verse 4 he's saying, our enemy isn't ourself and how we present things. Our enemy is the devil who so easily, especially with unbelievers, can blind them to what is the truth. And if you understand that, we have a starting point to move forward. To understand that our real enemy is not ourselves or the person we're trying to help that's frustrating us, but our real enemy is Satan. But the good news is, as we sang about this morning, that God's work, the work of Jesus Christ, the new covenant which he talked about 
in chapter 3 and in chapter 2 that Christ leads us in triumph and the light of God is much greater through Christ than anything is we know even though Satan is working that God is bigger and more powerful and we can trust in his work. The problem is if we don't know that and we don't know who our enemy truly is, we can get super discouraged super fast because we're looking at our self. And he says in verse 7 clearly, we have this amazing treasure within us, but we are this earthen vessel. We're earthlings. <laughs> How do you like that? We are earthlings. Our potential in ourselves, our minds, and our physical self can only go so far. Maybe I could explain it like this. Um, anyone ever had a clog in the sink? And you're not handy, so you don't rip it apart. But what do you do? You go to the store and you get what? Drano or something like that, right? Okay, so when you get that powerful chemical and maybe uh, you have four daughters like I do, and the sinks get clogged all the time. Um, I don't think I'm losing my hair. But anyways, maybe I am. Uh, so if you put the, the plastic, the container, maybe you're like, oh, it's all in the container. That's going to get the clog out. I'm going to use the plastic and smash it down there. Is there any power in the plastic container? No. The power is on the inside, the chemical that dissolves the clog, right? If you're a wine connoisseur, is it about the bottle or is it about what's inside? Is it like how nice the bottle looks? Is, is that why people, they celebrate and have a nice meal and, and they have a glass? Is it about the glass or is it about the liquid? If you have a soda, is it about the can or do you like the taste of of the liquid. And here what he's saying very clearly, it's, the, it's about the treasure that's on the inside, not the external container. And we, my friends, are the external container, but the power, the chemical, the sweetness is Christ within us. Yeah, do you see that? And so when we get discouraged, or when I get discouraged, and by the way, this message is, hey, you know what? Monday morning, I had to go get something. It was a little ways away. And I said, okay, start Monday. It's time to start looking at next Sunday. And I was discouraged. I was. And I was looking at myself like, I should, I could, I would have. You ever been there? I should, I could, oh, I blew it. I did, oh, I did good. Oh, Sunday was good or bad. You know what? Monday's the worst day for uh, a preacher because you're just like, Sunday you're on a little high, then Monday you're like, oh, but then the reality is, what did I do? What did I say? Or then when you're discouraged, when you hear of things. And I was thinking about that Monday, and it's God ministered to my heart. It is about me. I am the power. I am the one. And you are the container. You are this earthen vessel, my physical body. But the excellence of the power of God is within me to do the work. And so when I look at myself and how maybe ugly I was in that conversation or that sermon or that discussion or that action, I'm looking at the earthen clay pot instead of the value of the power of what is in it. And when you release yourself of that, you're going to be totally shocked to understand that you will be encouraged rather than discouraged. But we have a problem. As humans, we like to elevate humans. And the problem is we do that with ourselves. But Paul is saying very clearly, we have a real enemy. But the power that we preach is not in ourselves, right? It's in Jesus Christ. He is the light. And as he shines, 
It's this excellent treasure. And in that we have great encouragement. And it is a challenge to understand that God's this power because then we have to ask the question, God, why aren't you working? Hmm? But we don't know God's timing. But we have to learn and trust and not lose heart and not giving up understanding that He is greater than our enemy. You know, a lot of people, and you know, a bit controversial, I'm not here to, to, to pick a theological position. But people say, okay, if the God of this age, Satan, has blinded them, how do we work within that? Do we pray against Satan? How does that work? Or do we just believe God is greater and just leave it alone, trusting that he's going to work? And you know what? I actually think it's a bit of both. And so often in Scripture, when you come to difficult areas, we love to take a stand on one side or the other. But the reality is a little bit of truth from either one exists. And is God greater in spiritual warfare? And do we stand in the victory? You better believe it 100%. That's Ephesians chapter 6. And if Satan is working, you need to claim the truth and stand upon it. And that's it, Satan. I'm in victory and you're going to work. But there is a thought that is real, too, that we have this power within us to pray in the name of Jesus against the work of evil. And if you think you have no power, you don't understand the power that lives in you. I'm not praying my strength against this one who blinds these people. I'm praying the authority of Jesus Christ to work. And so instead of one or the other, do I stand in victory? God's going to take care of it? Yes. Do I actively pursue calling on the name of Jesus to have authority to bind Satan in that situation? Yes. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. And often when I'm praying for the unsaved, would you open their eyes, God? Have you ever prayed that? Would you take the veil away? Would you bind Satan so they can see the light of Jesus? There's nothing wrong with that prayer. Trusting then that God is in control and we can stand in his victory. Amen? So back to don't be discouraged. The age-old answer is always Jesus. But we need to apply it that it's not our effort It's His work. It's the new covenant. It's the work of the Spirit within us that allows us to understand that He is working. Look at Him and His power. You know, it's hard because no matter as much as we say we don't process through self, we certainly do. And you can limit it, but I don't think you can get rid of it. But you need to change from processing through how you view yourself in that situation to how God views you in that situation. And that's the difference when we look at ourselves. Come on! Amen? Amen. That's right. So... Understand your enemy. Don't be discouraged. God is working. He's greater. The power's within you. It's not about you. Secondly, you will face persecution and suffering. Sorry. But I want you to note it's very clear here that God's grace always gets you through. Let's, let's look at it. Let's look at the list. He says he's hard-pressed on every side. But God's grace helped him not to be crushed. He was perplexed. But God's grace helped him not to be in despair. He was persecuted. But God's grace helped him. God helped him not to know he was forsaken. Struck down. Don't stop there. Not destroyed. And in the work of things and the difficulty of things and the challenges which are real and what we see in people's lives, 
in the suffering in them or within ourselves, we have to understand that it's never the end of the story. And though things are happening, God's grace will get you through. You know, it's funny, sometimes when difficult things happen, why is it that we're surprised? I can't believe this is happening to me. You ever say that? Well, what did you expect in a sinful world? I can't believe they said that to me. I can't believe they did that. You know, I should know, but, you know, something happens, and I'm feeling blue, or someone said this, and I'm like, why? Why can't, why, God, why? <laughs> I shouldn't be thinking that. I should be like, thank you, God, that you are with me. And in the midst of the challenge, you promised it would come, but you promised something greater that you will be with me. And it is so, so important. We often pray to know the power of God, Philippians chapter 3, but it's easy to leave out to know the fellowship of his suffering. We have to know we'll face tribulation in the world, it says in John 16, 33. But how about this? Be of good cheer. Hello. And you'd say, well, that, you know, really me? You know, I don't know your challenge this morning. I don't know why you could easily be discouraged. I don't know what you're thinking. But I know God says, be of good cheer because he has overcome the world and the challenge that you are facing. And I think that's absolutely incredible. And that truth is one that I need to know. And even in Hebrews, a crazy verse would state that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. What does that mean? He was perfect. How does he learn obedience? But I know he went through so much for me. And in that challenge, it is stated that his obedience shined through. Don't you love it when it says, even in this passage, that the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day? <laughs> Talk about being discouraged. Forget about spiritual things. I was talking to a few people this week. I'm like, my body's falling apart and I've only hit 50. And it's easy when I was 30. No problem. Bring it on. Right? But I sense outwardly things aren't going as well as they once did. I'm frustrated. Frustrated. I was frustrated this week. Sports were a big part of my life. I can't do what I once did. The problem for me is was a little bit of my identity, so I'm going, okay, back to the truth, who God is, you know? But even work, I can't physically be what I was. But take note of something greater as we understand in some ways that we are failing and outwardly perishing, we can be renewed day by day internally to be so different and changed. The problem, sometimes when we externally suffer, we don't like that. We don't like any pain, and Paul went through a ton of it. But you all know when you go through a tribulation, physical or not physical, there's something that happens in that moment where you mature in your faith because you become dependent on God in a way that you never were in the good times. Okay, is that true? Yeah. Whether it's sickness or people who are hurting, and they hurt other people. And they hurt you. And it's an external thing. Forget about the physical body, the emotional. And it's hard. 
and there's an attack and we suffer and we're persecuted and we're trusting God in a way that we couldn't if we didn't go through that difficult time. So when we look at being discouraged and challenged, we have to think externally something's going on, but my character is growing internally. So thus, instead of poo-pooing everything and having a pity party, which I love to do, I can say, God, you're forming in me a greater resolve in victory and trust in Christ Jesus. We don't suffer well. There's a part of the Christian world that doesn't even think we will suffer. Or if we're suffering, it's because we've done something wrong. But there is sin in this world. And this world hates Christ. And the godly will be persecuted. But we have this hope that we are being changed and renewed Day by day. I love it how he says we're, in a sense, dying for the Lord. But we're giving the life of Jesus. So death, he says, is working in us in the suffering and the persecution. But it's bringing life to you, he says to the Corinthians. Maybe... You're going through a real hard time. Maybe it's people in your life. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's emotional. But I want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't lose heart in the midst of whatever your challenge is. Because God is doing a great work in you. Are you persecuted, perplexed? Are you struck down? Hard pressed? Understand God's grace will get you through as it would Paul. Isn't it interesting that Paul would say, for our light affliction is but for a moment. How about that? In the midst, doesn't affliction in the moment not seem light or short? Like, I heard it this week, but it's true. It's like, you, something happens to you. Like, I'm a big baby. Maybe I get sick in the middle of the night, and it's like 1 o'clock, and you got to throw up. And it's you keep looking at the, the clock, and it's like, it's only been 10 minutes. It's like, I feel like I've had to throw up for about four hours. God, get me out of this. This is the worst case scenario. And then if we're up for an hour, it feels like three days. Oh, am I the only one in, in, in the midst? And can we say, like, look, okay, we think we have it bad. I don't know. Paul's saying his affliction's light and he's been stoned. He's been whipped. He hasn't been able to eat. Never mind the problems, as I mentioned, of the churches and the emotional problems. Like, this guy probably suffered more than we'll ever know. And yet he's calling his affliction light. When's the last time in the midst of your affliction you called it light? Or that it was but for a moment? When's the last time with a problem with a child or a spouse, you're like, oh, this is such a light affliction. Like, no problem. No, Paul knew something because in hindsight... In view of eternity, these earthly problems are yet for a moment. Because God's concept of time to ours is completely different. And God is working to create in us, in the midst of other people's failure, which we don't at times deserve, a great work within us. And I want to tell you this morning... It is for a moment when we look in light of eternity. Whatever you're going through is for a moment. Because eternity is a whole lot longer than now. 
The time of your life is but a drop of water in the ocean of eternity, where you will be forever in paradise with no sin, no pain. So whatever you're going through for Christ, it is but for a moment knowing where you're going and for how long. And even in an earthly sense, in hindsight, doesn't things seem so much shorter than when you're going through it? Is that just me? No. It is. Until the next time where we face suffering and we're like, oh, this is going on forever. And by the way, for some of us, it is longer. And I'm not here to at all in any way put down what you're going through. I'm here to encourage you not to lose heart. I'm not saying the burden you're carrying is easy. I'm not saying that you should always be happy. I'm not saying you can't express to God what hurts. I'm here to encourage you with the word of God not to lose heart. Because some of you are going through some very, very difficult things. My word is God is greater. His grace is with you. He's changing you from the inside. You have an amazing treasure. And yet in the eyes of eternity, it is but for a moment. He will get you through. Look at this last verse. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We sang Waymaker, God's always working. Do you believe it when you can't see it? It's easy to sing a song, isn't it? I was talking to someone this week, and he said in his life, it's no one who attends here, um, so don't try and figure it out. Um, He's learning what he believes in his head is needs to come to his heart. And he told me his story and what was happening and how God was speaking to him in the midst of as he was looking back into his childhood and family and all the things he had experienced, and he knew the right answers to the pain he felt, but he never experienced that in his heart until God's voice spoke to him, until it became real, not (laughs) from the words on the page, but from the Holy Spirit speaking deep within his heart the truth he needed to hear. And some of us know this up here, but we're having trouble believing it down here. And what's going to get it there is your desire to be with God and not hear from me, but hear from him. That he will get you through. That He, in the midst of what is happening, His grace will be there. That His power within you. And that this, what we're all going through in this world, in view of eternity, is but for a moment. Put your burden on those three things. Just think right now, what is burdening you this morning? Let's do some real application. What burden do you have? What are you feeling? What are you challenged with? What is causing you to lose heart? Each of you, think of something. And apply the truth of Scripture to that. Who's the real enemy in the situation? Who's victorious in that situation? 
Where's the power going to come from? Maybe in that situation you're rating yourself. Can I tell you, stop? Stop. And look at the power within you. Understand that God's grace will, as you turn to Him, get you through. It's not the end of the story where you are now. And finally, view your challenge and burden in view of eternity and the things you can not see. Maybe you've lost something precious to you. It's not the end of the story. Go back to truth and let it speak not only to your mind, but to your heart. Amen? And that Monday, as I went to Merrickville, and I thought of this passage, and I was listening, and I was praying, and the way back, let me tell you something, the way back was a whole lot better than the way going. And today, <laughs> uh, don't, um, God handpicked you to be here this morning. You know that? He knew what the topic was. You have an opportunity. Every Sunday is just not a Sunday. I believe with all my heart that you are handpicked to hear this message this morning. Don't let it bounce off. Apply it and take it in whether you've heard it before or not. The opportunity to gain something from church isn't about the musician or the speaker. It's about you as you engage with the truth. It doesn't, I love that you come, but it doesn't even matter where you go. If they preach God's word, it's you engaging with that truth to bring it here. Amen? Someone said this morning, do you know, we ought to appreciate what we're doing because remember back a year ago we couldn't do this? And we just think, oh, another Sunday we get to hang out with everybody. Do you realize we couldn't do this for times? Whether you think it's right or wrong, but here we are with the blessing to do this and hear from God. Don't let it slip away. Take it in. Yeah, it's a long time since we've had a response, but sometimes response is good, amen? Yeah, yeah. I'm a Wesleyan. We used to have altars at the front, and people had to, they were invited to the altar. I'm not now, I was, but... It was a response each week, and sometimes we're like, oh, no response. We don't need a response. <laughs> yeah, because we're stating what is true, and we're asking God for help. So I just lead us through a prayer, and maybe we can pray for each other. Is that all right? Huh? <laughs> it's not so formal here. We're a bunch of friends, okay? Um, just think of being in our living room, and if you needed prayer, what would you do? You'd get prayer, right? You wouldn't care. Don't worry about the formal. We're at Farrell Hall. Like, who was here last night? Shania Twain or somebody? Like, if you have a burden, or let's put it this way, if you're discouraged, it's okay. All right? And you say, I want to apply those things. And I would love it if people... Or somebody prayed for me just because I'm discouraged. And no one has to stand up, and I don't want you to stand up because you all have to stand up. I'm telling you response is sometimes good, but if you think I'm crazy, that's okay. I don't care what you think. Sometimes. Um, <laughs> if you're burdened and you're discouraged and you don't even have to tell us why, would you stand up? I'm giving an invitation. 
Amen. Anyone else? If you're burdened or discouraged, don't be afraid. Last call, anyone else? Between you and the Lord, you're just making a statement. Now I'm just going to simply ask those around who feel comfortable, would you just lay a, ha- a hand on their on their back or shoulder? Yeah, let's let's go. Those Amen. And we're going to pray together for those who are discouraged. Yes, this is okay to do in church. This is actually why we're at church. Because we want these people to leave encouraged in the power of the truth. Amen. So, Lord Lord Jesus, this morning, you know the hearts of those who have stood up. And we don't need to know what the issue is. You know the hearts of who didn't stand up. But this morning, we are praying for those who have said, God, I need your help. God, I want to see your power. God, I don't want to look at myself and my dilemma. God, I want to know. I want to know eternity. I want to set my mind on things above. And so now as we lay hands, which is so scriptural, we pray for these, God, that you would speak to them, that you would encourage them. In this moment, they would know your truth and hear your voice and you would encourage them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for the gift of prayer. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of fellowship where we can support and encourage and pray for one another. And in the name of Jesus, whatever the situation is, we bind the lies and the deceit of the evil one in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we stand in your victory. We stand that you have conquered the enemy, an enemy you have no place in our life. We're praying the will of God so we believe that you will answer God. Amen. Amen. We're going to take communion this morning as we always do. The elements are in the back. Just one encouragement this morning. If you don't know Jesus, you don't believe in Jesus, I want to tell you, He loves you. He died for you. (laughs) It's not enough to know He's real in your head. You have to believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. That's what the Bible says. Amen? And if you've never done that, Kevin and Bob are in the back. They'd love to lead you. I will be. There is no greater decision you can make choosing Jesus. Amen. So how we do communion is here is Jim and Sharon will lead us. The elements are in the back quietly, respectfully. You can retrieve them. Take them back to your seat, thinking on Jesus and all he's done, the new covenant. And then when we're done singing, we'll partake together having common thoughts of Jesus. Amen.
thanks for Jesus this morning together. Maybe you've had a tough week. You're a banged up container. Scarred or discolored. Or maybe you don't think worthy to take communion this morning. It's the exact moment that you need and I need to remember Jesus. Amen what he's done for us, that we are forgiven. And as we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that he is Lord of our lives, that he came, died, and rose again, that we are different. We are forgiven. That's what we're doing this morning. We're remembering the amazing treasure within us, not the junkie container. We look at your body, Lord, broken for us, that we would be healed, that our brokenness <coughs> would be met. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Let's take the bread together. blood, the new covenant, I will remember your sin no more. Not only that, the Holy Spirit within us, all represented in the blood, the work of Christ on the cross, that he took our sin and he gave us his righteousness. So as we believe this new covenant, what Jesus has done this morning, you are righteous not because of what you've done, but because of Jesus and his death on the cross. Remember, remember, remember. Let's take the Jews together. Well, we've exceeded our capacity of time for the morning, so we will not pray together since we prayed uh, before. But as you're leaving, greet someone, enjoy them at the coffee table, and we'll see you next week. Have a great week. Bye-bye. next week.